I'm Hugo. This is Eric up at the front here. And um, as Ivo mentioned, we're going to be talking about robotics and specifically inverse and forward kinematics using conformal geometric algebra. So specifically conformal geometric algebra, which we heard a little bit about yesterday. Um, the things, um, the work here is obviously not just uh, done by me. <laughs> it's me, Eric, and our fantastic supervisor, Joan, who couldn't make it today because she's busy teaching and actually uh, being uh, useful to, <laughs> to Cambridge while we're off on holiday, <laughs> essentially. So thanks to Joan. So a little bit of motivation. Um, we use conformal geometric algebra and geometric algebra in general for robotics because we think that building algorithms to control robots is an inherently geometric problem, okay? Most of the time, uh, if you're doing forward kinematics, you're essentially chaining transformations together, rotation and translation of different sorts so that you can work out how um, joints should move in time and how uh, the frames attached to, for example, the end effector of a robot, uh, what orientation that is in, and things like that. Uh, and inverse kinematics is, is essentially quite often about uh, finding solutions to geometrically constrained problems, which often manifest themselves as intersection type problems with um, spheres and circles and lines. And so, as we've seen already in this little series of talks, geometric algebra is a particularly good tool for intersections and for representing transformations and for representing geometric primitives. Okay? And so, specifically, we work in one geometric algebra, or, well, we work in a range, but typically with conformal geometric algebra, because it contains a rich load of different geometric primitives that intersections and transformations between them, all in, in one algebra, and specifically because it contains spheres and circles, which appear a lot in the inverse kinematic equations for robots, essentially. So it, you'll see soon enough. So I'll begin with a little bit of a, a background, kind of recap on geometric algebra, um, the products. So. We'll construct a set of um, orthogonal basis vectors. We're going to call them E1, E2, E3, all the way up to EN, depending on how many uh, dimensions you want. And we um, will choose some uh, products of these vectors with themselves. So we choose, for the case of a 3D vector space GA, that they uh, square to 1, all of them. Okay? And if you multiply one of these vectors with another one, then you uh, get something that we will not simplify and we will just write E12. Okay, and this represents the, the bivector kind of plane through those two vectors. So we saw this yesterday and we saw those anti commutation properties as well. And so if we take two vectors expressed as linear combinations of these um, basis vectors and we multiply them together, you can see that you get objects coming out that contain both scalars and these uh, compound objects, which are these kind of plane, planar elements um, called bivectors. Uh, so the next thing, the next useful thing to define related to this is uh, a grade selection operator, which is often written with these uh, little um, brackets here. And so we, we choose to label things with a certain grade. So uh, the scalars are of grade zero, the vectors are of grade one, the bivectors are of grade two. It's all this, the kind of uh, number of things that you haven't simplified out. Um, and so if we define a grade selection operator acting on a multivector, then if there is a scalar in there and you give it a, I want grade zero, you'll get the scalar bit. If you want grade two, you'll get the bivector bit. And if you ask for, I don't know, grade one, you'll get zero because there's no grade one in there. Okay? And so this is useful because we can then write the geometric product in terms of these grade selection operators. And this motivates us to uh, define two other kind of derived products from the geometric product, notably the outer product or wedge product, which we will define like this. So for a grade 
A object and a grade. B object, the outer product, is simply the uh, geometric product between the two and then select the A plus B section of it. And we'll define the inner product as, for grade A and grade B, uh, the mod A minus B section of it. And lots of people define the behavior of this inner product differently with scalars. It's not a particularly interesting argument because there's, it, it almost never comes up if you're actually writing algorithms with this stuff. So, but you know, lots of people like to have little arguments about the about that. So, that's fun for them. <laughs> but we won't touch on it here. Okay. So we've got these three kind of useful products so far, and now we'll move on to conformal geometric algebra specifically. So. I haven't got my timing going. So, um, conformal geometric algebra is an embedding from three-dimensional space into a five-dimensional space. And we do that by constructing two additional basis vectors, which I've labeled here E4 and E5. And E4 squares to one, and we decide that E5 squares to minus one, okay? This is particularly uh, this is a little strange if you come from an engineering background originally, but if you're from physics, you might uh, think of this as fairly normal. Um, and bear with me, it'll, it makes sense as we go through. Um, so with this, these additional basis vectors, we can then construct two null vectors, okay? We'll label those n infinity and n zero, and they are um, representations of a uh, point at infinity and the origin in our, uh, in our new space. And they're particularly useful um, because they, uh, we can define things in terms of them, and as we saw before, it gives a nice geometric meaning to a lot of things, like rotations about, the, about infinity, our translations, etc. Um, but specifically, when we're building our kind of embedding from 3D to 5D, we uh, plug them in and create this formula here, okay? So, um, note people use a range of different notations, etc. but we're trying to be consistent for these talks. But uh, a warning, if you're reading papers, they're sometimes different. So, why have we chosen the specific mapping to go into 5D? Um, it's not a random choice. This has been designed, essentially, to have specific properties. So an interesting property of it is that if we put two points into this um, 5D space and then we take the inner product between them, then it turns out to be proportional to the distance between them. So we've somehow uh, embedded a notion of distance into our um, algebra, into our embedding of these points, okay? And so an obvious uh, um, result of that is that points themselves square to zero, okay, in our new algebra, because there is zero distance between them and themselves, okay? And as I said before, the null vectors correspond to the origin infinity, and we can see that quite easily for the case of n zero, if you just put in a zero into this, uh, into our mapping here, which is often referred to as, as an up function now, um, because it's easy to type in code, essentially. A lot easier than the Hessenes, you know, embedding or whatever it is. <laughs> so, but if you if you put in zero in here, then you'll note that all you that is left is the n zero section on the end. So this this represents our origin. We can check that. Um, so initially, it might be quite confusing as why. Well, so why have we gone from three D space and embedded it into a five D space? Well, we're quite used to doing that really in graphics and computer vision in which you're working with homogeneous coordinates and you go from 3D to 4D, we're just going up one more to 5D because we want to have a richer algebra and have more transformations possible. Okay, so, as I said, CGA allows us to define a rich load of different primitives. So, we have the points um, and we can combine these points together directly with our outer product, okay? So if you take two points and you wedge them together, um, you will get a kind of point pair, which some people use to represent line segments, etc. cetera. Um, if you wedge three points together, you'll get a circle. If you wedge 
uh, three points together, but take one of those points all the way out to infinity, then you'll get a circle of infinite radius, which is just an infinite line. Um, if you wedge four points together, you'll get a sphere. And if you wedge four points together, but take one all the way out to infinity, you end up with a plane. Um, it's very intuitive constructing objects this way. You can also construct objects uh, in that kind of dual representation. Um, so here you can define, you can parameterize objects um, in a way that you're used to if you're using games dev or if you're a, a graphics programmer or whatever it is. Um, so for a plane, you have a normal and a uh, you know, orthogonal distance from the origin. Uh, for a sphere, you have a center and a radius. For a infinite line, you have a direction and a point, etc. And so, and then I have the circles and point paths down the bottom as defined as the intersection of a sphere and a plane and a line and a sphere. So you can, can kind of construct these things and, and mix and match. Okay. And in the conformal um, view, it's really not that important what, what you take as your kind of main space, whether it's the, you know, the, Sometimes people will talk about dual spaces versus other um, kind of direct spaces. It doesn't really matter. In my talk, I'm going to flip between the two almost continuously. And I do that by essentially multiplying by this thing on the end, I5, which is the pseudo scalar, so the highest element in the space. Okay? The only thing you've got to watch out for is that it changes your signs sometimes. But to be honest, I tend to play fast and loose with my signs and then have a look at the end, see if it matters, and flip them if I need to. So. <laughs> That's kind of fine. <laughs> you can get away with it in reality. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a pragmatist. I'm doing this because I want to solve problems, not uh, because I just like the framework, although I do. OK. So we can directly program up these, thanks to uh, Stevens, uh, Ganter.js. And um, over here on one side, I think you can see, yeah. Over here on one side, I have the code that is generating these, this uh, visualization over here. So we have some points, which we've put up into uh, 5D, and we can drag them around, and we see that the wedge of uh, all of them produces the sphere, wedge of three of them produces this, this nice circle in red, and wedge of two of them, and infinity produces this, oh, actually, that's the plane here, this plane here. So the wedge of three of them in infinity. So we can represent them, and we can move them around, and it's all fine to compute the wall in real time. It's fine, we're not really doing anything heavy at the moment. OK, so the other nice thing that conformal geometric algebra has for us from a kind of robotics point of view is it has very nice primitive intersections, OK? So we use this uh, meet or V operator, which, is, which Leo talked about a little bit yesterday. And this performs um, intersection between objects. So it's uh, distributive and associative, and so you can kind of chain these things up and intersect lots of things in a row and transform them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's nice and easy if you're uh, building real things using it. Um, and another fun thing is that you always get an answer, even if these things don't intersect, your primitives. Um, you will still get something that's geometrically meaningful, okay? So for example, here on the right-hand side, we have a sphere, which we're intersecting with a range of uh, different objects, so on the top we're intersecting it with a line, and you can see that when it intersects we get two points that come out, a point pair, and if we go to the very end we get a kind of tangent point, and then we get something else, which is an imaginary point pair in this case, but it's related to how far away these objects are from each other, okay? So these are kind of built-in intersection operators that you don't have to program up, they're kind of built into the algebra, you just have to kind of understand, have a bit of intuition about how they operate, okay? which is fantastic because I'd rather someone else wrote my code rather than me most of the time, if I can. <laughs> so, okay. The next really useful thing um, from geometric algebra, and specifically in our case uh, conformal, is the transformations that are contained in the algebra. So CGA contains all of the motors, so rotation translation, but it also contains um, scaling and inversion, in general, all of the angle-preserving transformations, the conformal transformations, okay? And as we saw before, rotors can be represented as the exponentiation of bivectors, um, this is kind of Lie algebra to Lie group mapping. Um, I don't have 
enough time to go into all of this in huge detail here, but I've included some links throughout um, on my references slide. So I've got some of these which will take you to the references slide if, you're, if you look at these slides online, they're all available. So you can also kind of compose these transformations just as you would with your 4x4 matrices or whatever it is and uh, mix them in with intersections, etc., and it all kind of drops out nicely. Um, one of the important things to mention as well is that almost everything is covariant in all of these operations are covariant, so you can prove things at the origin and then in, in simple cases, and um, assuming that you've only used kind of covariant operations, this stuff just works in a range of different places in space, which is quite useful. Um, and there are a load of papers that use these. Um, there's, there's a um, particularly good kind of uh, reference paper on this, which is the covariant approach to geometry by uh, Anthony and Joan and a few others, um, Rich Wareham, which I look at every day because I can't remember all these. It's kind of a cheat sheet. So, transformations. Um, we can uh, do transformations. Oh, these should have some minus signs in. Apologies. Um, we can do uh, transformations by the exponentiation of bivectors, as we said, and uh, we can do this by a Taylor series and then simplify what comes out. And so if we do that uh, for a rotation rotor, uh, as we saw before, we get something of this form. Uh, translation rotor, we get something which is uh, of this form here and a scaling rotor of this form here. And they're all applied to all objects in a similar way, okay? You just sandwich, with, you sandwich your object with the rotor and it will transform it to some place, okay, in space. Doesn't matter what the object is, et cetera, et cetera, it all just works. So that's really nice because you don't have to write more code, special case code. Okay, and so here they are. We're applying some transformations to our objects that we had before. Uh, in this case, I'm applying them to the points and then wedging the points together. Alternatively, we could wedge all the points together and then apply the transformation to that. It doesn't matter. You can do both different ways. Okay. So I've commented all this Ganja code, so if you want to read through it at any point, then have a go. Um, I can't guarantee it's the cleanest, but I try my best. Okay, um, another operation that's particularly useful is reflection. So uh, in this case, it's again done by a kind of sandwiching type operation, and we can reflect objects in any object and any other one, really. Um, and so here I'm reflecting this red circle and this blue line and the plane here. And so if I move the points that define this plane around, we can move all of these in different ways. Okay, and you can see that it does what you would expect it to do. Great, okay, so we've got enough of a kind of framework now to start actually tackling some problems. And specifically, uh, we're interested in robots um, and forward and inverse kinematics of robots. And so we'll start with serial robots, which is your kind of classic robot arm, I would say. When you think of a robot arm, you think of one of these kind of like big serial robots that um, build cars. And here I've got, you know, let's get rid of the ad. <laughs> here you have some of these enormous kind of car building robots. They're very heavy, um, but they're very precise and they're used everywhere. These are super popular types of robots. But if you want to know how to control these um, to do different things, it is inherently a geometric problem of some sort, as we will see in a minute. So they come in the type of, yeah, building cars type ones, which are really big. And more recently, they've gone into these kind of collaborating with people type ones, which are much smaller, but still very heavy. So actually, the motivation for this talk was I went to a conference in Macau last year, and we have one of these robots in a backpack on our back um, going through, going all around Macau. And this thing weighs 26 kilos, and this is like the smallest one we've got. And at the end of it, I was like, there's got to be faster other types of robots. Um, which are better, so I don't have to carry this around in future if we ever go to one of these conferences. And so we'll come to those ones later, which are the parallel robots. But first, we'll carry on with the serial robots. Okay, so we'll start with forward kinematics, and we're doing this in, this example is entirely written in uh, 3DGA. Um, one of the advantages of 
CGA or one of the practicalities of using it is that it has 3D GA as a subalgebra and various other algebras as subalgebras. So in reality, as a pragmatist, I'm just going to mix and match, right? If you're building stuff and you understand how to use these things, you can drop between 3D GA, conformal, and the other different subalgebras. It doesn't really matter, and you kind of all blends through as long as you are know what you're up to at the time. But in this case, we'll have a look at uh, basically animating a little simple two-link serial robot. Okay? In the base, we have uh, two angles that define the orientation of this, uh, this upright, the, the lower arm, maybe. And so we can define the action of those by two rotation rotors. Um, we'll take this plane in which it's sitting in as the E1, E3 plane, because we're using a kind of graphics convention so that we can draw it nicely in GANJA.js. And so um, R0, which does rotation at this base, is um, from our previous formulae, uh, cos of theta 0 over 2 plus sine of theta 0 over 2, E1 wedge E3. Okay? And then equally, the R1, which does this tilting up like that, can be expressed um, with this bivector E1 wedge E2. Okay? And so if you combine these two together, you'll get the rotor at the base here. And if we apply that rotor to the, the kind of stationary uh, reference position of the uh, lower arm, we can get the elbow point X at any point in time. Okay, and we're just applying it directly to the 3D GA um, point, reference point, and we'll get a 3D GA reference, uh, 3D GA uh, elbow point that comes out. Okay, so we haven't gone up into conformal for this, although the rotation rotors happen to be the same between the both algebras. Okay, so we can, next we want to construct the elbow rotor here, so for theta 2, and we can do that by... Uh, Again, the same formulae with uh, E1 wedge E2, and we're going to multiply it by uh, the base rotor here to compose these two transformations together so that we can just apply that combined rotation rotor to the uh, reference position, reference direction of this uh, kind of forearm and get the end point coming out, okay? All in one. So this is very similar to what you would do if you're using 3D rotation matrices at this point. Um, and it's quite neat, and you can kind of just read off how it works from the equations. Um, yeah. And to show you that it does work, here we are, we're animating one in the browser, and I'm just drawing a little path um, as it moves around. Okay. So far, so good. So, the next thing that we would like to do is to try doing this uh, purely with kind of CGA type motors, um, because what we would like to know is what orientation is the frame attached to the end point. Like if you had a hand attached to the end of your robot, you want to know the coordinate system of that hand so that you can actually do things with it, like manipulate things, okay? And so this, is a, this would be similar to a kind of four by four matrix case, um, or you could do this in PGA or any of the other algebras that contain the motors. But here we're sticking with CGA because we're not that concerned about uh, trying to get the most optimal efficiency. We'd rather have more richness in our case for our application. So, again, here we construct the rotors in the base, R0 and R1, and then we construct this, uh, a translation rotor now, which instead of the, uh, just the reference position of the uh, lower arm, we use a kind of reference rotor, and again, then we construct the rotor in the elbow, and then finally another translation rotor to go along the uh, forearm. And the combined rotor, which takes you um, between the space of the end um, effector and the origin, is just the combination, the composition of all of these rotors together. So just multiply them all together, and you'll get something which, when you apply it to N0, will give you the end point. Okay, this is, again, very similar to what you would do with 4 by 4 matrices but expressed in perhaps a somewhat more readable form in this case. Okay, great. So we've got forward kinematics. We know how to move these motors to make our endpoint move and what, how it will look, this frame, 
in the uh, end effector when we do it. Um, and so, again, we can simulate this one just to prove that it works and for people if they want to uh, go through the code and check that they understand it. And we're animating it again just in the same way as we did the last one. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, it's because I set up the, is the orientation of this theta 1 and theta 2. So um, in the case that the both of them are zero, the robot is kind of collapsed in on itself, right? It's, so one of them is pointing forward and one of them is pointing backwards. So that's why you get that sign difference between the translation rotors here. It's just that um, this one is defined as being positive E1, and this one here is defined in the rest A as negative E1. So that's a good question, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, so we can do the forward kinematics. We know how to move the motors and the endpoint, how the endpoint will move as we do that. The next thing we would like to know is for a given endpoint position, how should we move the actuators to get there, right? This is the inverse kinematic problem. So given y, how do we get thetas? Okay. Uh, specifically, in this case, what we are really after to begin with is the elbow point, um, because that will allow us to find theta, the various thetas. So, as I said before, inverse kinematics is often about um, geometric constraints, okay? So the intersection of spheres and circles, pretty much. And in this case, for this simple uh, serial robot arm case, is the intersection of two spheres that we care about. So. The first thing that we're going to do is construct a sphere um, around this endpoint here, which has a radius of the length of this upper arm here. Okay, and that's this one here. Then we're going to construct a sphere at the base, which has a radius of rho, which is the same as uh, this lower arm here. And so if you think about it, the position that this elbow point can be on is the intersection of these two spheres. It has to be somewhere around there. And so we can just use our meat operator to get a circle, which is the circle that these things lie on. Okay, It's just the object that is the circle. Um, we can then have additional one additional constraint. So for the case of this robot, we only have two degrees of freedom in the base here. And so we've uh, forced it to lie in a kind of vertical plane. And so we can construct another vertical plane here. And in reality, the robot uh, elbow position has to lie on the intersection of that circle and uh, this plane that we've defined, this vertical plane. So there are two possible solutions for it. And we can just choose one, uh, probably the one that looks you know, more reasonable from a kind of uh, physical point of view if you're building a robot. And we can project it out and get the 3D position of it to feed into the rest of our software. Okay. So here, that is, here is that graphically. Um, so we have an endpoint over here, okay? And we have our sphere at the top and our sphere at the bottom, and we can see this red circle, which is the uh, kind of possible positions that that um, elbow point can be on. And we can see that the intersection of the two of them, yeah, with this plane produces this, these two possible solutions here. So the robot arm can either be like that or it could be like that. But realistically, due to physical constraints, you'd most likely have it in this position here. So I've chosen to uh, select that one as the correct answer. Okay. And so here I've also drawn the uh, angles um, that at the base and in the here that would come out of this uh, specific setup as you drag it around. So I think this is quite a fun little demo because you can move it around and see what happens. We can also detect whether or not the endpoint is reachable. Because if I drag this too far, then note our uh, meet operator returns something which is an imaginary sphere, an imaginary circle in this case. And we can detect that by just squaring the circle. And if the circle squares to something negative, then it's impossible. Okay? So I've got a little check in here. I check if the point pair actually squares to uh, something greater than zero. And if that's true, then we're good. If not, then do something sensible. Okay? So it's a quite a nice little trick to, uh, to check whether it's possible. Okay. So 
that was fun. We've done our kind of serial robots. Um, they were nice, but as we, uh, as we mentioned earlier, they're a nightmare if you're trying to go to a conference in Macau. So you want something lighter, really, um, and faster, ideally, for specific other types of tasks in which you're not you know, building cars. You're, you're manipulating things that are small and need to be done fast. And so to do that, people came up with the idea of these kind of parallel robots. Um, and a parallel robot is composed of multiple kinematic chains, okay, which are not normally not all fully actuated. Okay? And it is the combination of these kinematic chains which, which all impose constraints on the end effector that determines the actual final position of the endpoint. So here we have three common examples of parallel robots. The Stuart platform was probably the first parallel robot. Um, I think it was originally designed as a tire testing machine, um, which is quite funny because it is now used everywhere and in you know, uh, motion simulators and all sorts. And it has prismatic joints that move, and essentially this, uh, this endpoint can tilt and move around translationally as well. Um, but we're, today we're going to talk about the Agile Eye in the middle here, which is a rotational parallel robot, so designed for um, moving cameras very fast, or lasers, or something like that. And we're going to talk about the Delta robot, which is the uh, parallel robot that has probably found most success in industry, okay? um, because it's really fast, uh, as we'll see. And great. So we'll start with the Agile Eye. And the 3D version of this looks mad, right? If you look at a physical setup of it, you're like, how did you ever come up with this? It's crazy. Um, and like I said, they're designed for orienting cameras really, really fast. The whole point of these parallel robots is that you don't move the mass much, OK? You fix all of your motors and all your heavy stuff to the base, and then you actuate your end effector via passive links um, which have very little mass, they're all just carbon fiber rods or something like that. And as a result, you can have very high accelerations um, for your end point. Okay? So there are two types of Agile Eye here. There's a 2D version, which we'll deal with first, and there's a 3D version, um, which we'll go through afterwards in a bit less detail because it's a bit more complicated. Um, and also, it's absolutely nightmare trying to draw it, I can tell you, an animator. <laughs> Right. So, oh. first the 2D Agile Eye. So here I've got an animation of a 2D Agile Eye um, moving around. And this is the code that is uh, drawing that. Essentially, this is the mass that defines and draws this. So we have a motor in the base here and a motor on the side. And the, um, each one of those defines a rotor. Okay, just as we had before in the serial uh, robot case. Using those uh, rotors, we can find the position of these elbow points. Okay, so this one on the side directly joins to the uh, I'm going to call it the camera plate. Okay, because that's where you would attach a camera in reality, or a laser, or whatever it is, and. This one on the back here is attached indirectly via a passive link. Okay, But we can get these positions exactly by uh, just applying our rotors to a 3D GA vector um, and looking at where it comes out. And you get a 3D GA output. We can then, um, so that's one constraint. We know that the camera plate passes through this point here. And uh, we know that it is some fixed distance from this one on the back here. OK. Um, we next create two planes, um, which are then operated on again by these base rotors. So this is one plane, and here is another one. And you can see how easy it is to construct these things. And we construct an additional sphere. And this sphere is of the same radius as the camera plate and is based around the center here. And so the intersection of those two planes and that sphere uh, is the uh, cyan circles that I've drawn on here. They're quite light, unfortunately. But perhaps you can just about see that the intersection of those two cyan circles is this point pair that spans across the camera plate, okay? which I've represented here as uh, T. And so using that and our point on the edge here, we've 
fully defined the orientation of our endpoint of our of our plate, and we can draw it. Um, so we can get out our point at the top here from our point pair, and we can quite easily construct this kind of normal from the plate as well, just using these kind of basic equations. Uh, so the point really here is that if you can think of the geometry of it, you can write down the geometry, and it'll kind of hopefully just fall out as you go through. Um, obviously, this is not the most optimal solution. You can, if you're just interested in the orientation of the endpoint, there are much faster ways of doing this, or you can just take this stuff and plug it into a simple calculator, and it'll come out and optimize it out to something that's nice. Um, that's not really what I'm going for here. I'm more like trying to explore the geometry of the constraints of these robots, okay, as we go through. Cool, okay, and so here is the code, just to prove that it's not uh, a GIF. It's all animating in the browser, and, and if you're interested, you can have a read through, um, et cetera. So the next thing is the 3D Agile Eye, and I found a nice rendering of it in a, which is a bit more simple than the, uh, than the real models. They construct it in the kind of uh, slightly more elaborate way to prevent self-intersections and to get a wider range of movement. The kinematics are essentially the same as this simple model here on the right. Um, but essentially, you have a motor here, a motor here, and a motor here. And all of these motors have axes that meet at a single point in the middle, which is the, your axis of rotation. Okay, And you have your camera plate, and your camera plate uh, rotates uh, purely in a rotational sense about that center of rotation, okay? Defined by these um, positions of these points here, and so driven indirectly by your motors at the base. And the advantage of the 3D, the three degree of freedom Agile Eye, is that not only can you uh, rotate the top one around, you can also roll your camera about its own axis. That's another additional thing. So for camera stabilization or whatever else, it's quite an interesting um, degree of freedom. So we can define a, uh, a rotor that fully defines the position of this. And what we want to know is what angle should we move the uh, joints to, the, the motors to, in order to achieve that, you know, to get our camera looking in that specific direction with that specific role, OK? So each of these uh, fixed axes defines a uh, fixed circle on which this elbow point can lie, OK? We know that if this thing has to lie on a circle orthogonal to this uh, direction and with a set distance away. And the same for each one of the other ones. And so that, combined with the position of this camera plate that we've defined, tells us exactly how we should move our motors, OK? And so, like I said, it's, it's kind of more messy to draw. So I've had to draw it as a kind of uh, simplified version to an extent here, but I'll talk you through the geometry of it. So this is our camera plate in gray, and this is our base here as a circle here. So each one of these black points here represents our motor. And as you can see, they all have these axes that intersect at a single point in the middle here, which is the uh, center of rotation. And if we focus just on one of them for a minute, I'm just going to focus on this one here, you can see that this uh, motor defines this possible elbow uh, position circle. And this joint here, which we've defined its position based on our rotor that we're using to control um, to define the endpoint entirely, um, we can see that that also provides a circle, which um, is the constraint position of this elbow. And the intersection of the two of them is a point pair so there's another solution over here, one there or one here, um, where the elbow could possibly be. And so again, we'll choose one based on, you know, we'll choose one direction for all of our elbows to go in a circle to stop them from hitting each other. And so we can just do that. And that gives us uh, the elbow position. And so from there, you can work out quite easily the angles at the base that you need to move it to, et cetera. Um, and it's quite neat. Um, I quite like these little parallel robots. They're, uh, they're very smart. <laughs> but the people who design these things must be uh, pretty sharp, for sure. Um, cool. So while those robots, the Agile Eyes, are quite nice to look at, and they provide a good example of the geometry of these type of problems, they're not that widespread in industry yet, because they don't have any kind of killer applications at the moment. Um, 
the robot that does have loads of killer applications is this Delta robot, okay? And I'll show you why it's so useful. Again, it's another type of uh, parallel robot. And here it is moving. And the point is, up at the top here, you've got a base and you attach three motors to it. And each one of those drives an arm, which is then attached to these kind of carbon fiber rods down here. And this endpoint over here moves incredibly fast, like super high Gs. They've got like 10 G acceleration on the endpoint. And um, they're stiff, they're precise, they're light, they're cheap, they're great. Except that they can't lift up very heavy things. So you're not going to use one of these things to build a car. But you, in fact, they, uh, they were designed because uh, this guy over here, Raymond Clavel, uh, EPFL, they, his lab went to a chocolate factory and they saw a load of people packing chocolate, okay? And he wanted to uh, design a robot to do this chocolate packing problem where you're lifting very light weights and uh, you're moving them very fast on a conveyor belt. So they came up with uh, the Delta robot to do that. And so let's get into the geometry of the Delta robot. Essentially, it has a plate at the top at which you attach motors to, three motors, and each one of these motors is attached to a rigid arm, okay, here. And the, at the end of that rigid arm, we have a four-bar mechanism, okay? That's what we learned about back in mechanics, or me and Eric did uh, in our undergrad. And those four-bar mechanisms here shown in red, each one of these attaches to the end plate down on the bottom, okay? And so the combination of these three four-bar mechanisms holds that end point plate such that it's always parallel to your motor plate at the top, okay? So you drive these three motors, this thing always stays parallel, but it is, uh, can move translationally up and down and sideways, and it can do it very, very fast, okay? Because there's no mass here. This is all just carbon fiber rods and, you know, basically stuff that doesn't weigh anything in comparison to your motors. It's also, you know, cheap. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, cool. And yeah, they, they just have bull joints, or uh, you can have two uh, kind of uh, anti-rotating joints there as well. Um, so the forward kinematics of this, if we get into the geometry of it, um, essentially, we'll start by looking in plane of one of these joints, okay? We're gonna look at taking a slice through this robot um, in plane with one of these in a reference position. Okay, so this is the center of the motor plate. This is where your motor attaches to the, the motor plate. Here's your elbow. Here's the point where the uh, forearm attaches to the uh, end effector plate. And this is the center of the end effector plate, which I've labeled Y. That's effectively where you're going to be picking things up from. So it's what you want to control. Um, and so if we solve this uh, forward kinematic problem, we're essentially have these three different constraints that come from each one of these um, parallel kinematic chains. And together, they all define the endpoint. So this, as you can see, is going to be a constraint-based geometric problem involving some form of intersection by default. And in fact, it is. So the way to solve this is to um, define these kind of pseudo elbow points, which are just in from your elbow point by the radius of the um, end plate. Okay? And at those points, to construct a sphere of radius rho. Okay? And so if you do that for each one of these three um, limbs, then the intersection of those three spheres provides the center position of the endpoint, um, just like that. So if we did that in geometric algebra, we will write down uh, the 3D GA position of this center point, then we're gonna put it up into uh, conformal, then we'll construct a sphere about that pseudo elbow point, and then we just intersect all three spheres to give you a uh, point pair, okay? Um, we were, in fact, we'd constructed these as dual spheres, so we multiply by the pseudoscalar to get the, uh, the point pair, and then we can just project out and we get the end point, okay? And it's super nice and easy, essentially, to solve, and it just relies on 
inbuilt operators of the algebra, essentially, and functions. So it's a neat little demo of it. So geometrically, well, so here's a little example of it animating and moving around. I'm just writing these angles either in radians, so apologies. Um, but you can see, in this case, I haven't drawn these parallelograms. Um, I've just simplified it as drawing a single line um, in this case because uh, I ran out of time, essentially, in preparing my presentation, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but you can see that it does work, and we can move it around, and it works quite well. And you can see the range of motion of this robot, um, like that. And if we look at the geometry of it, then we can see that the elbows all lie on these circles, and the intersection of our pseudo-elbow spheres right on here is this red endpoint position in the middle. Um, there is, of course, another solution point on the back here, where all three of these spheres meet here. But realistically, if you're building a real robot, you can't move there. <laughs> um, because of the physical constraints, you've attached this to something. Um, things intersect in the real world in, uh, in ways that you don't want. You've got motors in the way. So, but we can quite easily see this coming out on the end. Okay. And in fact, oh, I've got a little slide down at the bottom here, I might take a little second to load. We can also, from this, calculate the kind of reachable area that our robot can get to, the volume that it can get to, um, because uh, we just move it to as far as we can in one direction um, so that the arm is straight, and then sweep it through the other um, limbs. And this is, so this is the reachable volume of a robot uh, that I was simulating there, okay, where I just put, picked a few points and applied quite a fun color scheme, okay? So, so that was all nice. We know how, to, uh, how the endpoint will move if we move the motors, but what we would also like to know is how should we move the motors to move the endpoint in a specific way or to get it to a specific place, okay? So that's the inverse kinematic problem. And the inverse kinematic problem for this uh, delta robot is, again, just about intersection of spheres and circles. Um, and so uh, we'll go through that now. So the first of all, the first constraint that we have is that the elbow point, the true elbow point, must lie on a circle um, in the uh, motor uh, attach the motor, essentially. It has to have a uh, length of the lower arm, and it has to lie in the plane of the, of the motor, okay? So that defines a static circle, which we've labeled CI here. We constructed that from uh, a sphere and just intersected it with the plane of the motor, okay, to produce this circle object. Uh, again, in this case, it's a dual circle object. I've flipped between the two kind of continuously and when you're working CGA um, because it doesn't matter too much which you take as your primary space. So, um, so you have one of these elbow, possible elbow positions and the next thing you want to know is uh, for a given position of the end point, we want to nail down exactly where on that circle this elbow is. So we can construct a sphere at the, uh, just off the end point position. So if you have the plate, this is where your parallelogram meets the plate. You're going to construct a sphere there, which encodes the fact that the elbow has to be a set distance away from that position, okay? The length of your limbs, the length of your uh, parallelogram, essentially. And so we define a sphere at that point, okay? Uh, which is this one here. And it has a length rho, which is the length of your uh, forearms. And then the intersection of your circle with that sphere is the position of the elbow point for that specific limb. And again, we get two uh, solutions for it, but again, due to the realities of building robots, you're only going to use one of them, okay? Probably the, the most outside one so that you're less likely to hit things. Okay, so the maths of this, once you have your um, circle and your sphere, you can then intersect them again. In this case, we're using, we're in the dual, so it's just the wedge of the two things. And then we can take out our point, which is our elbow point, and we get it in 3D, and then we can just get our motor angles out from that. 
I'm sorry if it's, this sounds a little confusing. Don't worry, I've got some I've got some animated demos for you. So first of all, here's just one of it moving around. And in this case, if it gets to a position that is unreachable, then it draws a little circle around it. Um, that was not necessarily intentional, but it just happened to be, and it's quite useful. I mean, we can detect those very easily, again, by squaring the intersection of these of this um, the point pair intersection, if it squares to less than zero, then you know that it's impossible to get to that point. Okay, and so the geometry we can visualize again um, like this. So at each one of these black points, which is on the end effector plate, we can draw a sphere and we can intersect it with our known uh, possible elbow position circles. And so the intersection of the two of them is where the elbow must be, okay, as we move around. And so as you can see, if we get to a point where it's impossible and they become straight, then it's not doable, etc. Um, so you can see the possible range of motion that comes through. And it's quite a nice geometric problem. And a lot of, in reality, a lot of uh, parallel robot problems have to be defined in terms of these like multiple geometric constraints etc. And so if you have these nice built-in intersection operators and like we have in CGA or in the other GAs, then it comes out a lot more easily. You're much less likely to make a mistake if someone's already written your intersection operator for you, is, uh, is how I look at it, really. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'll just mention that uh, you can um, do we saw actually yesterday that you can do calculus essentially related to these geometric algebras and specifically in robotics you quite often like to know about how um, the end point will, the velocity of the end point um, with respect to uh, the motor velocity. So if you set one motor to a specific speed, how will the end point move? What's its velocity going to be? This is very useful if you're designing control algorithms, right? And so you would like this both forward and backwards. So you'd like to know how does the end point, what velocity does the end point have if I give a certain velocity to some of the motors? And you'd also like to know what velocity should I set my motors to in order to follow a set velocity of end point, right? So you can set up trajectories, etc. And so in my slides, I have a whole load of, uh, of essentially calculus that goes through, which is differentiating these uh, intersection uh, set up these, these forward and inverse kinematics with respect to scalars, um, which is, turns out to be a lot easier than doing it with respect to multivectors, but I, I'm, I haven't got my head around that yet, but I'm working on it. Um, and so you can just calculate these things and then plug them straight into a whole load of your other robotic algorithms. You get out the kind of the Jacobian matrices, which you can use for uh, you know, uh, force control or all sorts. And uh, it's quite easy to do this with geometric algebra is specifically because we've linearized our intersection operations in this case. And so uh, a lot of the uh, code, a lot of the uh, maths of it turns out to just be um, differentiating linear functions of things, um, which is quite easy, broadly. And in general, you're intersecting quite um, essentially data book cases. You know, you've got, you're intersecting a sphere, the intersection of a circle and a sphere, and you want to differentiate with respect to the center of the sphere's position. These are all like standard cases that people have done before, or that we can just draw up a little table for, and then you can consult every time you're doing it. So as an engineer, it's quite easy to do these kind of things. Um, but I won't go through that now because we don't really have time, and I want to get onto some other exciting stuff, some of the new work that we've been up to. But if you are interested, then I've got it on my slides, and you just go down at that point into forward and inverse Jacobians. Okay, so the next thing I would like to talk about, really, is how are we going to represent forces and um, dynamics, so statics and dynamics in CGA. And uh, this is some quite new stuff that we've been working on. Um, so don't take it as the Bible yet, but we're, uh, we're definitely getting there, and it produces physical results, which is exciting. So, what we would like to talk about first is statics, and specifically, how can we represent a force in our CGA uh, setup? 
And so we're going to choose to do this by representing forces as lines in our algebra, okay? And specifically in this case as dual lines, so they're bivectors. Um, but I've chosen this because it's quite a natural representation of a force. You know, they have a line of action in the real world. They have a magnitude uh, and they have a kind of orientation along that line. So we can just construct forces to do that. They have, uh, we can represent them as unnormalized lines. So they have a magnitude, we have a direction, and they have a 3D point through which they pass. Okay, very simple. And so, as I said, this is a, a dual line. So it's a bivector in this case, which turns out to be important later. So, uh, what are our conditions of static equilibrium? We'll think first about that. So what happens if we apply all these forces to a rigid body and then we want it to stay still? Okay, so first of all, uh, you want no net linear force and you want no net moment of all of these forces about uh, the center of mass. Okay, so what does this mean for our setup of we, we've chosen to represent forces as lines? How can we then uh, use that in our rigid body statics problem? Well, what happens if we just add all of the lines together? It's the first question that I asked myself as a uh, pragmatist. So it turns out if you add two lines together, you get another line, okay? So this is the form of a dual line, and if you add two lines together, you get another thing that looks like a line, and you get something that doesn't look like a line, but is still a bivector, okay? So um, what we would like to understand is what are these objects that have come out of adding our two lines together? And so we'll try that by looking first at uh, a simple case of two lines, force lines in plane, okay? So here we are, we have two force lines, uh, the two black lines here, um, going like this, and we add them together. We've got them in plane and they pass through this point here. And we then add them together, and they produce this red line here. Okay, I've weighted them over here. So if we give them equal weighting, then we find that our resultant line passes through the center of, uh, the, through their intersection point and is directly bisects the angle. But if we give them some other weighting, then we'll note it still passes through the intersection point, but no longer uh, bisects the angle. In fact, it, uh, it doesn't, but we'll see how it, what it does do in a second. Um, we can check what this object is by squaring it. So in CGA, if you square a, um, an, one of these objects, they should all square to a scalar if they're just a pure blade, essentially a pure like line in our case. So if we square our line, which is just the addition of L1 and L2, and square it, then we see that we come out with a scalar, so we're, we're certain that this thing that comes out is just a pure line, okay? And in fact, so to summarize, yeah, if it's a pure line, it means that this other non-line bit has to be zero, and in fact, what we have is the resultant force line of, of the addition of these two forces produces another one, which is the line of the resultant force, and so, it has a magnitude the same as the vector sum and direction the same as the vector sum, okay? Which is what we'd want, really, if we were gonna start constructing our statics problems in, in this way. So great, but this hasn't really told us what this additional non-line section is. Um, so let's consider parallel and anti-parallel cases. So first of all, if we have two parallel lines in plane and we add them together, okay, so that's, uh, L1 plus L2 gives us L3. I've weighted them the same in this case. Then we get this red line here, and when we square it, we see that we get a scalar. Okay, so that's good. We've added these two parallel lines together, and we've got just a line coming out. Okay, so these two forces, parallel forces, combine to give you a resultant parallel force in the same direction. If you, however, choose anti-parallel forces, okay, in plane, and you add them together, physically, you have constructed just a, essentially a pure moment. There's no uh, resultant force uh, coming out of that. And so we'll see that if we add these two anti-parallel lines together, then they square to give zero, so there's no line component that comes out. But the actual component of it, if we print it, has something else in there, okay? And so it turns out that this other section of it is just the pure moment 
caused by the addition of these, the geometry of these uh, force lines acting on our rigid body, okay? And so we'll take, in general, this form that it produces, this bivector form of a, a 3 dga uh, vector and an n infinity to be our form of a moment, okay? So we're gonna take, in general, the form of a moment, our representation of a moment, as being a vector uh, wedged with n infinity, okay? So that is what this is here, because these are three DGA vectors, and this is a scalar on the front. And so, in this case, we've got a moment that comes out from these two things. And if we look at skew lines, what we then expect is to have both a resultant force line coming out and also some kind of moment. And indeed, if we add together this line and this line, then we get a uh, red line here, which we can reweight. And but we also, if we print it, we have both it squares to something which is uh, a scalar plus something else. So it has this this uh, resultant force line section and something else. And in fact. Um, that stuff is the moment, as we discussed previously. So, if we have that as our form of a moment, then what we'd also like to be able to use for practical uh, problems is we'd like to be able to calculate, for a given line and a given point, how much moment do we have about that point as a result of this force, okay? And so we can do that by this little formula here, uh, which comes out of essentially as representing it as a, a wedge of a a uh, line and a point gives you a plane and the dual and it kind of drops out and simplifies to this where you just take your dual, dual line and you dot it with your point and you wedge with an infinity and that gives you something of the form that we're using to represent moments that has um, a magnitude of this vector which is the magnitude of the moment. Okay. So, it's quite neat so far. And in fact, um, this kind of leads us onto uh, a little bit of uh, essentially some quite older maths, which is screw theory. So we have, in fact, got screws, screw transformations that come out of these addition of two lines. So we add two lines together, we get a line, and we get, so which is like a linear force along it, and we get a moment, which is in some way a kind of rotational force about that line. So we have a kind of screw force and this is known in the screw theory literature as a wrench, okay? And in general, the f like we can view lines and moments as the general case of, uh, as special cases of screws, okay, of wrenches. So if they are just pure lines, then the moment bit is zero, and if they're just pure moments, then the line bit is zero, okay? But we can view all of them as just a special case of a screws, okay? And if you add and subtract screws, you'll still stay on the screw manifold. And in fact, screw theory is a thing that people love in robotics literature um, because it can do all sorts of amazing things. Um, but uh, we're kind of slowly, I'm slowly working my way towards it at the moment. Um, okay, so we'll continue and see how this plays out with our setup. So if we uh, view these, all these lines, these forces and uh, moments as special cases of screws, then we can just write down a rigid body as an equilibrium if we add up all of our screws and they add up to zero. Okay? Which is kind of neat, I think, overall. Um, the real question then becomes, all right, so we've done statics, but what happens if they don't add up to zero? What if we have unbalanced forces? How can we do dynamics within the same framework? So, it gets a bit more technical at this point, but bear with me. So, we're going to define a quantity called omega, which is our screw momentum, okay? So, this is essentially, you can view this if you're coming from a classical physics background, it's like a combination of linear momentum and angular momentum, um, but in one, and it's, it is a, yeah, a screw momentum, and we're going to define it such that the sum of our wrenches is its time derivative, okay? This will look familiar to you maybe if you're from a physics background in that uh, uh, torques are the um, time derivative of angular momentum, etc. And we're going to define a screw velocity, which we're going to call uh, B dot, such that um, if we write the rotor that takes our, uh, transforms things from the body frame to the world frame, then 
if we write multiply by the screw velocity and times by half, we get the time derivative of the rotor, okay? So this is, um, these are definitions that have been done before in a lot of different ways. This is a slightly different take on uh, dynamics to, and um, rigid body dynamics to uh, what people have done before in CGA, but it's very related. And so I put some more links in the back here if you're keen to go and dig into those. Um, okay, but given we've set this up, what we then need to know is how um, will our forces affect the um, angular momentum, the screw momentum of our body. And so we can do this via this concept of the kind of principal screws of inertia. Um, in fact, this is not quite so Ball was the guy who came up with uh, screw theory originally with his treatise on the theory of screws. And he defined a set of principal screws. And we're taking a slightly different take on that, more down the route of Plucker and uh, Kenneth Hunt. Okay? So, but basically, you define for a rigid body, which is either rotating or translating in some specific kind of screw way, we're going to say, um, what happens if we apply a specific wrench? So either like a rotation or a translation to it. Okay? How, oh, oh, sorry, a force or a torque to it. How will those screw um, forces, those wrenches, affect the screw momentum? Okay? And so we can consider this by, so that's one of these, each principal screw of inertia is one of the six degrees of freedom of our body. Um, and so each of them lie aligned with the axes, and essentially they act to scale the um, effect of these forces in a way um, that you can map between velocity, screw velocity and screw momentum, and vice versa, in the body frame, in the axis-aligned body frame, okay? Um, so that leads to us defining this thing called the screw inertia tensor, which does this mapping. I'm not particularly pleased with this formulation I've got here because uh, it could definitely be a bit neater, and we're kind of working on that at the moment. Um, in fact, I think this whole thing would drop much nicer into PGA than it does in CGA, but you know we haven't got round to that yet. <laughs> yeah, Charles. Yeah, I can see Charles looking pleased. Exactly, I'm sure it does. Um, but I work mostly in CGA, so I decided to stick with it in CGA, and especially as I work between the two. Yes. I haven't read that, no. Okay. Hmm. That's definitely interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different takes on... Yeah, there's lots of different takes on how you can do it. Um, um, I decided to start with my kind of ref representation of a line in the algebra that I know because that's kind of what I was, uh, I was like, I want to start from an intuitive basis and see what I can build up from that. Um, but again, I'm, you know, by training I was not originally into, uh, I'm not a physicist, so I've, uh, I'm coming at this and learning as I go. But uh, I'm enjoying it so far, this whole dynamics business, I've got to say. Um, so anyway, the screw inertia tensor. Um, the screw inertia tensor maps between the... Uh, screw velocity and the screw momentum. And so if we apply it, it's a linear function that we apply to the uh, screw velocity and we will get the screw momentum. And we can define a, uh, in the body frame, and we can define an inverse of it as well that will map back again. Okay, and so these turn out to be the form of the principal screws of inertia. And we can calculate this, we can set this up via a kind of inverse reciprocal frame um, with these kind of reciprocal principal screws of inertia, like so, okay? And so the parameters that we have as a designer or of a roboticist working with us is that we have the mass of our body here, um, and we have the second moment of inertia about the different axes, okay? Um, and they all feed into this one equation. So with that defined, I think we're just about ready to have a go at simulating some things. Um, and so we're going to use a, for a standard fourth order Runge Cutter method. And so to do this, we require a function that takes um, the state at a given time of our whole simulation and returns the derivative of the state. Okay? And then we feed it into this Runge Cutter. 
solver and it'll come out with something. And we need an additional um, kind of initial condition for it, okay? So, um, and our goal will be, let's simulate some physical phenomena that we know exist and check whether they emerge from our maths. And if they do, then hopefully we're, uh, we're onto the right track. Okay, so these turn out to be our governing equations. We're gonna track state is gonna be our rotor at any point in time that maps between the body and the world frame, okay? And our, uh, ang our screw momentum defined in the world frame. Okay, then our function that returns the derivative is um, like this. Remember from our definition of the screw velocity, this is true. And to um, calculate our screw velocity, we take our world uh, screw momentum, we map it uh, into the body frame, and then we apply uh, the inverse inertia tensor to it. Okay, so that's this. And um, our wrenches, which we here we're defining them in the body frame because it's normally the, the situation that you have if you're calculating forces on an object, um, we can map into the world frame by again just applying this rotor, and that is the rate of change of our screw momentum. Okay, so I think we're just about ready to simulate it. And so the first thing we'll try simulating is uh, the intermediate axis theorem. Um, this is a result that if you uh, spin a rigid body which has three distinct um, uh, principal axes of inertia, uh, moments of inertia, then it will spin stably about two of the axes, but unstably about the third axis, okay? And it will do this uh, with, so if you give it linear momentum as well, it should, the center of mass should move linearly while it is rotating unstably about the other axis. So that's what I've got set up here if we run it again. So you see we start it spinning this way and it's unstable, and so it does a little flip, okay? And this is quite fun. If you look on YouTube, you can see videos of books doing this in space and et cetera. Um, astronauts love doing this one. Um, and you can see the center of mass is also moving linearly. So this gives us some uh, encouragement that we are onto the right track um, as sort of physically uh, realistic. And I've linked down at the bottom here um, some videos from our own uh, Hugh Hunt from the University of Cambridge who loves doing these videos of different sorts and simulations related to physical stuff. So check out his website if you want to see more cool spinning phenomena. Okay? And then the other thing that we would like to look at is uh, the precession of a spinning top or gyroscope. Um, so far I haven't dealt with uh, constrained motion at all, you'll know. So in this case I'm doing a, a precession of a gyroscope on a uh, frictionless surface. And so in this case, because there is no uh, horizontal reaction force, we'll expect our gyroscope to uh, process about its center of mass. So this endpoint here will, over time, move around here. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't uh, set up my uh, parameters to be particularly um, fast moving, so it, uh, it takes a long time to process, but I promise you it does process if, uh, if you sit here and watch. Uh, and down, down at the bottom here, you can uh, check out some videos of, uh, again, this setup of uh, gyroscopes processing. Oh, oh no. Oh, God, no. <laughs> okay, well, I was basically at the end of my slides anyway. Turned out that wasn't plugged in. Um, so that was essentially my last slide, although Eric has uh, some things to go through in a minute. But um, yeah, I promise you they are physical. That procession is something that does occur. Um, and there are a load of more examples on that. Oh, sorry, I just wasn't plugged in, Benny, I think. This is my laptop shut down, because I was an idiot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's my bad there. Um, but again, it was my last slide, other than a thank you for listening and some uh, reference uh, slides, so thanks. All right, so I'm Eric, and I'd like to talk to you very briefly about how you can start doing some geometric algebra today in your own software. So we've already seen Gander.js, which was used in Steven's presentation extensively. Hugo used it today. It's fantastic for building interactive demos of robots, of operators. You can do it all in the browser. You can show it to people, and they can run it on their own computer or even on their mobile phone. So that's great. You could even perhaps put it in commercial applications for showing people things on websites. Uh, but it's not necessarily great for robotics, because not many robotics projects are written in JavaScript. Uh, that will change. That may not be a good thing. Um, that didn't 
people that want it. So another thing you can do is you can use Python. And one of the things that Hugo and I have been doing is using Python for a lot of our projects. And one of the big advantages of Python is you have access to all of the other tools that the scientific community is using. So things like NumPy, things like SciPy, Jupyter, Pandas, and of course recently there was the black hole image, which was produced using all of these Python tools. So there's clearly a huge scientific value to working within the Python ecosystem. And so to that end, we built this Clifford toolkit, which gives you a bunch of different geometric algebras in Python. But you lose out on some of the animation issues. So to join up the benefits of Ganja.js and of Clifford, we've built a tool called PyGanja that lets you do your computations in Python and then visualize the results using Ganja. Uh, I'll show you some very quick demos of that online and how you can download this and use it yourself. So this is the documentation page for Clifford. We have some brief instructions on how to install it. I'm not going to go through these in, de these in detail, but you can access this website later in your own time. We support a bunch of different algebras. So we have um, the algebra space, we have conformal algebra, we have PGA, although we don't have any examples on how to use that here just yet. And then we have this list of tutorials. And one of these tutorial sections is for conformal geometric algebra. And in here, we have some introduction to CGA, which is probably not as good as the presentations you've seen so far this week. But also we have some examples. So we have an example on how you can define some objects in Python, how you can define a scene to visualize, and how then you can visualize a Ganja scene exactly in the browser like we've been doing in the presentations. And we scroll down, you can see that we do that for 3D as well. And again, you can explore it in 3D. So this is useful for writing things in Python, checking you've got them right, but because you're in Python, you could do something like import a library for a serial connection and then actually send these commands to your robot after you visualize them on screen. And I'll show you one more thing on here. So this is some examples from today's slideshow. Again, we have some of the maths, we have some code, and we have some visualizations of the robot computed using Python. And if you want to try these out today, at the top of each of these examples, there's this launch and binder link and this will launch a Python notebook on a remote web server that you can then run all this code without installing anything on your machine and try it out. Uh, so I'll give a very quick demo of that. I'm hoping this will start quickly. Hope isn't always enough to make progress bars move quickly. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. This is almost the same page as the one we were just looking at, but the key difference is I can now click here and run all of the code in these cells. And so if I scroll up to where we start visualizing, which is here, you can see we have these three visualizations. And if I wanted to change the trajectory, so maybe I want to make it move twice as fast, I can change one of these numbers. I can run the cells and I'll get a re-rendering, it looks like I made it move below the ground. So this is a very easy way to play with your Python, visualize what's happening, and hopefully then use the same code for experimenting with the maths as you then use in your application. But at the point you go commercial with your robotics, you probably want to use something like Klein, which has been mentioned extensively in the other presentations today, and definitely looks like the future of PGA computing. Thank you, that's all. <laughs>